very happy to have you here today. Um, hello to all WiseLiners, PHP Jalisco community, and to the people new to our networks. My name is Laura Perales, Academy Program Coordinator at WiseLine. And for those who haven't heard about WiseLine and WiseLine Academy before, let me do a quick introduction. Um, WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the USA, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain with six years of experience and more than 700 employees worldwide. We started as a product company and gradually migrated to the services once we realized that we could help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, UX, project management, SRE, etc. WiseLine is a trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. And as part of our character, WiseLine empowers employees and the community to innovate and grow their careers. This, sorry, careers. This is the reason why WiseLine Academy was created. So WiseLine Academy is a platform that offers free educational programs such as workshops, talks, um, certification in today's most high value skills in technology. Like today's uh, talk prepared by Barry, Senior Software Engineer at WiseLine. You can uh, follow us on social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn to learn about upcoming courses. And last but not least, Please enjoy the course, try to be focused, ask as much as you want about the topic and do some networking. This space was created for you. And uh, a message on behalf of the PHP community, they are opening a new chapter of the PHP community in Guadalajara after years of uh, apparent stagnation where we can see PHP not only surviving, but growing and evolving. So they will continue offering talks and welcoming all and new PHP developers to contribute and participate in the community. So thanks again to everyone and Barry, thanks in advance for your dedication and for sharing your knowledge, of course. The mic is all yours. Well, thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so thanks for attending everyone. Really appreciate you sharing your time with us. To introduce myself, my name is Barry Hughes and I'm a senior software engineer here at WiseLine and I'm living up in BC, Canada. At this point, I personally have been working with PHP for over a decade and that includes plenty of time working on projects based on the popular WordPress and Laravel frameworks, uh, including some where the end product was distributed to hundreds of thousands of users. And I'm sharing that because for me, PHP has really been at the heart of my working life for a long time now. And it's a technology that I, I really love and perhaps more importantly, trust. So like all active projects, uh, PHP itself, it's continually evolving and growing. And I'm really happy uh, to be talking to you today about exciting changes that are coming in PHP 8. So we'll start with uh, a quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. We'll have a, a brief introduction about what to expect with PHP 8, when we should see it arrive. And then we'll jump into covering some of the most significant new language features. We'll follow up with some topics relating to cleanup and consistency. Um, and then we should have a spot uh, for questions at the end. Some important notes before we, we dive in. Uh, if you could identify yourself in Zoom using your name and last name, that'd be great. Please do mute your microphone along the course just to control noise. And if you could use the chat for questions uh, during Q&A sections, that'd be great. Please do focus your questions on the presented topic. And if you could turn off your camera just in case of connection issues, that's appreciated. A quick reminder of the Academy Code of Conduct. Please be respectful. There are no bad questions or ideas. Be welcoming and patient, and be careful in the words that you choose. Okay, so introducing PHP 8. Uh, let's start with the timeline. PHP 8 is expected to arrive at the end of November, uh, specifically November the 26th. 
beta 3 is available now. And actually beta 4 was literally released today uh, on September the 17th. We expect release candidate 1, uh, RC1, to become available on October 1st. If you're interested in taking PHP 8 for a test drive, uh, a really fast and easy way to do this, if you're familiar with Docker, is to pull down the official images uh, on Docker Hub. Uh, beta 3 can be pulled down right now. Beta 4 isn't there yet, but I'd expect that to become available in the next few days. So why should we get excited about this latest version of PHP then? Well, it's providing a huge range of new language features, and if you're familiar with other modern and actively developed languages, you'll probably uh, recognize some of these new features, which include constructor promotion, name parameters, match expressions, attributes, and a lot more. So much more is, is coming in PHP 8, actually, that we can't cover everything uh, today, um, but we'll certainly cover some of the, the most significant new features. And most of this really is aimed at letting us write cleaner, terser, and safer code. Things that we can start thinking about, um, really planning ahead, for lots of active projects, we can't just switch to PHP instantly, uh, primarily because we often don't control uh, the server where our code is deployed. But even in cases like that, we can still plan for the update by testing our code base and libraries that we use to identify any problems or compatibility issues. And we can also make sure that the changes we do in the meantime are forwards compatible. So having a, a good picture of what's coming with PHP is very important. So we'll dive in and start looking at some new language features. Before I do that, I'd be interested to know if you're happy to share in chat um, what your background is. Do you use PHP in most of your projects? Do you come from a Python or JavaScript background or are you new to programming? If you want to just take a moment to share in chat, that'd be great. Okay, so we've got one PHP old timer, a fellow WordPress builder there, it looks like. Good, wow, well, and someone who's been using PHP as far back as PHP 3. Okay, fantastic. So we'll move ahead and we'll start by looking at named parameters. Uh, this feature is all to do with readable self-documenting code. Anytime we call a function or a method, we now have the option of specifying the parameter names. And particularly when we work with functions that accept lots of parameters, uh, this can help us to make our code slightly more readable. And in some cases, it may even make it shorter. So what I'm going to do now is move to my editor where we can share some code. So to begin with, uh, just as we kick off, I have a very simple hello world script here, uh, just to explain my local setup. And it outputs, amongst other things, a PHP version. And I have one Docker container running that lets me execute this using PHP 7, like this. Okay, so the latest 7.4.10, and also PHP 8. As you can see, it's 8.0.0 beta 3. Let's take a look at named parameters. So I've stubbed out a function here, and the goal of this function is to take an HTML document and convert it to a PDF. Of course, this is just a, a stub. It doesn't really do anything, um, except it gives us some useful debug output. What I want to focus on, though, is the list of parameters, which you can see here. We have one mandatory parameter, HTML file path, and the remaining four are optional and have default values already. You can see down at the bottom of this file, I've got my call to this function. And let's just do a quick confirmation check and make sure it actually works as expected. All right, excellent. So in this scenario, let's suppose what I want to do now is convert my HTML to PDF, but I want it to be black and white or grayscale. So I want to turn color off. Looking at the function definition, I can see the, the color parameter here, which is set to true by default. Now, up until now, what we've had to do is specify all of the arguments before that one. So in this case, I need to specify 
embed images as false. I need to specify embed fonts as true. A scaling factor of 1.0 before I can finally say that I want color mode to be off. With that done though, let's rerun the code. Okay, excellent, so that worked. Uh, we can see in the output color is now grayscale. Um, we're interested less in the execution of the code though and more in this code here where we call the function. All of these three uh, middle arguments, these are just the defaults. Um, so in some ways we could say this is unwanted noise that we'd, we'd like to dispose of. There's a second problem, uh, which is one of readability. Now in my example, of course, we can quickly scroll up and look at the function definition and see how it works. But sometimes we're pulling in code from a third party library um, or we're looking at code during code review via GitHub and it can be hard to know what each of these arguments actually does. That's where named parameters comes in. And it's very simple. We simply take the same names defined up here and we apply them down here in this fashion. Okay, let's save that and run it again. Okay, good, so it worked. We got the same output as before, which is what we expected. The key benefit here is that we've made it a lot more readable because we've added a name for each argument. Note too that I did not uh, supply a name for the first argument. I could have done, but I wanted to illustrate that that's not necessary. If we don't supply a name, it's regarded as a positional argument. And so long as we supply those in the defined order, that's just fine. Now, the other benefit of name parameters um, is that we can remove optional parameters where we're happy with the defaults. And in my case, I'm happy with the defaults for these three. So I can simply remove them. If I run this one last time, I should get the same output. I do, success. And we have a shorter, terser, more readable function call here as a result. Just gonna pause and see if anyone has a, a question about that. Uh, Benoit, we can use the argument index. Do you mean at the call site or inside the function? Uh, in the call, can we use the index like from zero to uh, four? four well, that's a really interesting question. Okay, I don't believe we can. Um, it'd be interesting to look at that. I, don't feel that there'd be a strong benefit from doing no, things you, with the numeric index. Uh, you'd use the read readability we're referring to. Yeah, you'd lose the readability. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I can't actually say, is that allowed? I'm not actually sure because I didn't look at that. Um, but the chief benefit in the expected usage is, is largely as I've illustrated here. Okay, let's move on to another feature which is union and mixed types. And this is all about improving type safety. So it's not uncommon for a function to accept or return values that might be any one of several different types. Uh, a function might accept an ID and that could be an integer, it could be a string. Um, and, and sometimes that's fine. Up until now, if we do this, it's been common to use doc blocks. So the PHP doc standard to communicate that sort of information. Uh, but now the language is, is caught up, if you like, and it's got built-in support. And it's done that by adding union types, a new mixed type, and the false pseudo type. So let's go back to my editor and take a look at those. Okay, so we've got some different code Oops, here. This is a simple function that outputs a birthday message. And as you can see, it accepts two arguments, name, and I've specified a type hint here of string and age, which is unhinted. Now, if I try to run this, um, we can see here I'm passing an array. It, it's not going to work because it anticipates that age will either be a string or some sort of numeric um, value. Let's just try running that. Okay, so it did actually work after a fashion. It says, happy birthday, Jimmy, you are array. Um, clearly that's not what we want. And of course, PHP also gave us a warning uh, because of the array to string conversion. So how can we communicate that we want age to be an int, a float, 
or a string. The traditional way is recovered is to use a dot block and specify that up here. That's great, but it misses enforcement by the language. And it's also a bit more verbose than we, we might like. From PHP 8 onwards though, we can specify that union of types in the parameter list. And you can see the syntax there. So rather like we'd use in a dot block, it's a, a pipe separated format of everything we accept. So that's nice and it'll make it a lot clearer what a function does and doesn't accept. Something else we can say about this function is that it returns one of two different types. We can see here that it might return false, a boolean or bool. And we can see here that it might return a string. Now, again, another convention borrowing from a PHP doc, say that it returns mixed. And as of PHP 8, we also support that. We can write here mixed as a return type. And at this point, that really reduces the need for the slightly more verbose stuff that we have in doc blocks. It's all communicated right there and provides us with a lot more type safety. Mixed is new, but it also isn't as precise as we might want to be. So again, for return types, we can also use a union type. In this case, that might be a union of bool or boolean and string. So far, so good. And we'll just do a quick confirmation test to make sure that this runs as expected, noting that I still have this uh, error, if you will, of I'm passing an array. Okay, now we get a much more specific error, a type error, and it's thrown a fatal. And it's telling us specifically that argument two must be of type string, int, or float, but an array was given. So we're going to get much better uh, error messages, and it's going to catch problems a lot earlier. I'll just correct that so that it runs as expected. Now, back to the return type. Yes, it can return a bool, but that boolean will always be false. Um, this is a really common pattern, and lots of built-in functions in PHP do exactly the same thing. They might return an object or some other value, but if they can't, if there's an error, they'll return false. For that reason, PHP is introducing a pseudotype, false. And that just gives us much uh, more specific information about what can be returned, because the reality for this function, lots of PHP built-in functions and some from third-party libraries is that they don't return true, they'll either return false or some other type. So I hope that's pretty clear, but if anyone's got questions on this, definitely just drop them into the chat. So does it support nullable as well? Yes, it does. In fact, that's quite interesting. Let me simplify this uh, a little bit. Well, let me not simplify it. We could add null here. Um, and that is the expected way to have a union of null and multiple other types. If this only returned, let's suppose it didn't return false, it could only return a string or null, we typically use a slightly shorter convention, uh, which I believe is introduced uh, in PHP 7.4, the addition of the question mark before the type, marking it as, as nullable. And that may be a convention that a lot of you are already used to. The same in principle applies to the parameter list. Okay, so let's move on and look at constructor promotion. Personally, this is one of the features I'm really quite excited about um, because it's going to reduce the quantity of boilerplate in our classes. So it's common for classes to have multiple property declarations. And then we typically, or, or very often, we have a constructor that accepts multiple arguments that correspond directly to those same properties. And then inside the constructor body, we have a, a piece of code that takes those arguments and assigns them to the properties. So that's a lot of boilerplate. And this new feature of constructor promotion aims to address it. So let's go back and take a look at some code. Okay, so a pretty simple class here. This, uh, in a crude way, models a school report. We have three properties, student ID, grade, and attendance, which we can think of as a percentage. A student attends 100% of the time or 50% of the time, whatever that is. Our constructor accepts three arguments that correspond directly to those. 
We have a small, very simple safety check in here. Uh, we don't allow an attendance of greater than 100%. If that does happen, we throw a, a short message, um, or rather we output a short message, and we reset attendance to 100. And then we do the work of assigning uh, each argument to the relevant properties. A little further down, you can see where I'm creating my new school report object. And if you're sharp eyed, you may have spotted a somewhat deliberate error in here. But let's try running the code. Okay, so the object was created and here we see the print our output. I draw your attention to the value of the attendance property, which is 98. If we look at where I created the object, I actually passed in 98.5. And the constructor does indeed accept a float. However, when we assign it to the matching property, some type narrowing is going on, it, it becomes an integer. And so we lose information. Now that could in some cases be deliberate, but it could also be a subtle bug. Constructor promotion partly uh, helps to, to reduce the risk of that sort of thing because it reduces the that we need to achieve this result. So let's see how that works. First, I'm going to remove all of these property declarations. I'm also going to go into the constructor body. I'm going to remove these assignments. And for readability, I'm going to break up the parameter list so that there's one param per line. Now to take advantage of constructor promotion, what we need to do is specify the access modifier for each of these. Now in this case, we were using private for each field, but we could just as easily supply protected or public as you might normally do. And simply by adding that here, we take advantage of constructor promotion. I'm gonna save my change and rerun the code. Okay, good. So it worked, it ran, and looking at the value of the attendance property, it's correctly set to 98.5. Something to understand about constructor promotion is that by the time we enter the body of the constructor, promotion has already happened. So let's suppose I supply an attendance of 200%, which by design the code doesn't allow. Well, it supplies us with this message saying that uh, attendance can't be greater than 100% and that it's auto-corrected it to 100. But actually, we see that our attendance property is already 200. Well, that's because by the time, again, we enter the body of the constructor, it's already been promoted. So what we'd need to do here is actually set this attendance work in the property, not the argument that's passed into the constructor. I'll read on this one last time. And we can see that this time, our safety check kicked in and it has as expected corrected attendance to 100. So that's constructor promotion. Uh, I hope you'll agree it potentially will make uh, things a lot a lot tighter. We'll have a lot less code to do the same thing. And last but not least, where this is a little more complex, we might accept uh, additional arguments in the constructor of any type they don't have to take advantage of promotion. So we can mix and match. We can have some properties or arguments that are promoted and some that are not. If you have any questions on this, I'm just going to open the chat and take a look. Okay, so Carlos, I, I think, did I, did I answer your, I didn't see your question initially, but did that answer it, that we do need to use the this uh, special var? Okay, excellent. And yep, if we are using multiple constructors, in that case, are you asking about inheritance? No, not really. It's just like if you have only four elements in the constructor, but you have five attributes more at the class level, not in the constructor, because those are manipulated after by maybe when they constructor itself. 
So is it okay that you have attributes, some in the constructor, in the construct function, and others at the class level? Something like, like I've got here with the protected data property? Yeah, for example, date of join or the hours, and that's gonna be created uh, after or inside of the construct, right? But you're gonna have- Yeah, multiple... exactly. Assuming we don't, assuming this isn't something simple where we, we put a default in, uh, in this case, um, we'd have to handle populating it according to some logic in the, the body of the constructor or as a method that runs post-construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But you, you have it in one place only, right? Not in both. In this example, yeah, I, I was just demonstrating promotion, but we could have this uh, further property that isn't promoted okay. and, and it is set uh, later on according to whatever logic makes sense for the application. Does that, am I understanding your question correctly? Yeah, I mean, what my concern was just about like having everything clear and readable at the top so we can understand all the attributes for that specific class. So everything is like at the top of the class so we can know which are the attributes. I see, so okay, I, I, I did misunderstand you then. So in this case, for example, student ID, can it live um, you know, at the top level in addition to being promoted here? Exactly, it's just like to, to, to have everything in one place for like a better documentation, let's say. Well, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, no, that's not allowed. Um, but let's let's bear that out with a quick test. Uh, and just to clarify here for, for everyone's benefit, so we have the student ID promoted property here in the constructors list. But I also have student ID up here at class level. So, and the error we get is cannot redeclare school report uh, student ID. So that's disallowed in this case. Um, that's an interesting observation. I hadn't actually thought of it from that angle before that perhaps with a mix of, of different types of property that might harm readability. Um, yeah, sadly though, that would, that would seem not to be allowed. I, I do recall there was a reason for that and it actually escapes me, um, but we could potentially follow up after this uh, session. Oh, it's good, but good to know. Thank you, Barry. Excellent, yeah. Um, let's look ahead at the next feature, which is null safe method calls. So dealing with functions and methods that might return null is a really common problem. And it's easy to protect ourselves against this. We can test using a simple if statement if something is null. But it comes at a cost because it makes our code longer. It makes it more verbose. The newly introduced syntax, which is for null safe method calls, provides a way to safely handle these scenarios in a concise and highly readable manner. So I'll just head back to my editor and take a look at a few more examples. So I've hidden some of the, the implementation details, the definitions of the, the functions and objects here just for clarity, but hopefully it's pretty clear what's happening. And the scenario is that we're working with a database of employee records. So I have a function, get employee, and given a valid ID, it will return an employee object. If it doesn't get a valid employee ID, the risk is that it returns null. Similarly, I'm hoping to be able to call get vacation report which is the method of the employee object. And that in turn might, reply a uh, might return a vacation report or it could return null. And this continues right to the end. I ultimately want to discover how many days of vacation an employee has yeah. remaining. And, yeah, yeah, down. Yeah. A ver, pásame la and the risk is that that could return uh, null instead of an integer. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Uh, let's just clear my terminal and see how this runs. And I can safely use PHP 7 for this example. Okay, so this worked. I passed a valid employee ID and everything worked as expected. If we change that, a fatal error. Um, and it's the classic error. I'm sure lots of us have seen this many times. Hopefully not. Um, I'm trying to call a member function, get days remaining on null. So the prior call obviously returned null. Um, how can we guard against that? Pretty common problem. And one strategy looks something like this. We simply, each time we call a function or method, 
We check the result and ensure that it's not null before we take the next step. That tends to lead to this sort of deeply nested if structure. And of course, we can flatten things out. There's different ways to structure this. But nonetheless, there's lots of layers of, of check, um, of, of checks and safety check in there that makes the code a bit more verbose. So this alternative version should deal more gracefully with the problem. And it does. We don't get a PHP level error, uh, and it reports that it couldn't determine how many days of vacation are left. But as I say, the, the chief thing here is that we've got quite a lengthy body of code to deal with a pretty routine problem. So what does PHP 8 offer here? Uh, again, I've got 456 as the ID. This is the bad employee, if you like. And you can see that I have the same sort of chain of calls here on line four that I had in the original code, albeit it's broken up over different lines in the original. The difference is this operator here. You can see the question mark preceding the arrow. Uh, and that, in essence, means that if the result of the first call is null, it doesn't go any further. Um, to that end, all we need to check uh, is that our final result is not null. In this case, I use not empty. Um, and that works in principle here. If I run this, okay, good, bailed out with this second message. And if I change the code to use a valid ID and save it and rerun it, okay, it gives us a correct number of days of vacation remaining. So null safe method calls, it's a neat way to chain calls in some cases. Um, and reduces the risk of calling a method on null. Just gonna pause and have a quick look in chat in case anyone has questions on this. Okay, sounds like this one is pretty clear. Uh, if anyone does think of questions after the fact, um, we'll have some space at the end of the, the session. Okay, match expressions. This is another one that I personally am quite excited about. Again, if you, you come from a, a background or you actively use other languages, you may well have seen this there. And it's a safe alternative to a traditional switch statement. So the classic switch statement has a number of properties that we might see as problematic. For one, it's a statement rather than an expression. So in of itself, it can't actually return anything. Um, it also has a feature which is called fall through logic. Um, and that can be a source of subtle bugs, especially when someone is coming to the language, um, either they're new to programming or they're coming into PHP from a different language where switches work in a different fashion. Let's go back to my editor. Let's just clear things up quickly. So we'll start with a look at the classic switch statement. Uh, a bit of a contrived example, of course. Uh, I have an animal here, an eagle. I'm using the switch statement um, to try and determine what sort of animal it is. For example, you can see here cows and dogs are categorized as mammals, eagles and parrots as birds, lizards and snakes as reptiles, and so on. And if we don't have a match, we have some code here to, to handle that. And of course, a switch may not be the best way of, of doing this, uh, tackling this kind of problem, but it's a nice way to, to illustrate some of the problems that exist with it. So in this case, again, just summarize, eagle is what I'm interested in working with. Let's try running this code. Okay, so it worked insofar as no errors or warnings were produced, but we can also see the output says eagles are a type of reptile. And I'm not a biologist, obviously, but that's wrong, I believe. Uh, eagles are a type of bird. And the problem, classic problem, the break keyword that we can see in our other clauses, oops, is missing from the bird section. So the assignment of the string bird to class does happen but logic immediately falls through here and reptile is then assigned. And that's the result of that issue. I'd also take a moment to note, and I could have formatted this in a few different ways, but I think you'll probably agree it's quite lengthy. It's again, quite verbose. Uh, so let's look at the new match expression. 
which is an alternative that we can start taking advantage of from PHP 8 onwards. So here we, we have essentially the same code rewritten to use a match expression. Straight away, we can see that there is only one assignment to the class var. So instead of seeing something like this, we've reduced all of that, that's, that's gone. We can also see that just as with a switch, we're able to match against multiple different uh, strings in this case, and we can still specify a default. So it's a lot uh, shorter, it's a lot, to my eyes, it's a lot cleaner. Match expressions are new, but rather like arrays, they also boast that uh, double arrow syntax. It's perfectly legal to have a trailing comma at the end. So let's run this new version. Okay, so good. Expected result. Eagles are a type of bird, which is what we want to see here. And no errors. If anyone's got any questions on this, definitely let me know. Uh, so starting with, is this optional? Um, I'm just slightly unsure of what you're referring to there. The, the match expression uh, certainly is, is optional. We don't need to use it if we, we don't want to. Unless perhaps you're referring to the previous section on null safe method calls. Ah, okay. So yeah, null safe method calls, totally optional um, as are match expressions. Could we use an expression and uh, not just a plain variable? Uh, the answer to that escapes me. I'll need to double check on that. Um, I was reading through the relevant RFC and I believe it detailed that, but right now it escapes my memory. Uh, and, and similarly to accept an array, uh, that is something I would need to check on. That's an excellent question. And, and ditto for multi multi dimensional arrays. I, I'd need to double check on that. That's a really great question, though. All right, attributes. Um, this is a type of metadata. Again, if you come from a different background, you might know of them as annotations. It's long awaited. People have wanted this for quite a while, and it provides us with a language level means of associating metadata with classes, methods, functions, and class constants. So top level constants, nope, they don't currently support attributes, but class constants will. Let's take a look at the code. Okay, so we'll start with, uh, there are no attributes here as such. There are these, if you like to think of them this way, pseudo attributes that we've used using PHP doc or the doc block standard. Uh, I'm saying that I want this function to be called when an HTTP request comes in, that is a post request and matching this pattern here, blog slash ID. And we see this same convention used for, for lots of cases. Um, we might use it to supply pretty much any arbitrary data that doesn't really relate directly to how this unit of code works. Deprecated could be one, um, and so on. It's used so commonly, it made sense to bake it into the language. Um, and what we're left, what we have now in, in PHP 8, is this sort of syntax. Just add one for the moment. So a hash symbol at the start, and as I'm sure most of you know, and you can see from the way that my editors highlighted it, that also means a comment. Therefore, so long as we only have a single line attribute, uh, this is essentially backwards compatible. Under PHP 7, single line attributes like this won't throw any kind of error or cause any problem. Of course, they also can't be seen or observed by other code. Um, so that's of mixed or dubious benefit, um, but that's an observation. Um, and 
we can have multiple attributes and they can accept, in this case, it's uh, HTTP request is associated with one value, the string post. It can be associated with multiple values uh, or indeed it could have none whatsoever. Now, in this case, I can't actually directly demonstrate how this works simply because I'm using PHP 8 beta 3 and that doesn't support this style of, of attributes, which was very recently voted upon. Uh, so I apologize for that. However, beta 4, uh, as soon as that's available for download, um, we'll all be able to experiment with that. In principle, though, the way we'd work with this is something like this. We'd use the reflection API. So we'd instantiate, type that correctly, we'd instantiate a new object of the type reflection function, and we'd pass in the name, in this case, of the variable. And then to get the attributes, we simply use the new get attributes method. We can iterate over that, just as you might expect. And each attribute has, I believe, three methods, including get name. In this case, we'd expect that to return HTTP request and get values, which might return something like this post. Again, I can't demonstrate it. I can't actually run this code live because under beta 3, it, it isn't actually supported. It does support a previous syntax uh, that had been considered with this uh, double at symbol. But of course, in the end, that's not what we'll be using uh, when PHP 8 goes live in production. Okay, I'll take another quick pause just to check for any questions on this. So far, I don't think there's any. So we'll move right on to string functions. Uh, in PHP, we have three, rather PHP 8, three new functions that are specifically designed to help us test if a string starts, ends with, or contains a substring. And you can see I've itemized them here, uh, very clearly named string starts with, string ends with, string contains, and they have the same signature. So a haystack first and then the needle. And it's kind of surprising, uh, prior to PHP 8, the language didn't provide dedicated functions for these tasks. And so up until now, most projects have used their own workarounds and there's a few different ways we can come at each of these problems. Um, I'll just pause and ask, what do we think the, the, the issue might be with uh, some of the common workarounds? If you want to just post a brief summary in chat, that'd be great. Multi-byte, that's a really great question. Well, interestingly enough, there will not be, uh, and for everyone's clarity, I'm sure many of you know this, most or many string functions can be prefixed MB underscore, which makes them work with multi-byte. Um, that isn't the case for these. Um, in most cases, that isn't an issue. I'll reverse what I said there. I see what you're saying with workarounds. Yeah, that could be a problem. Um, for these baked in versions, we don't need multi-byte versions. The key thing though is, well, one readability. Uh, if, for example, let's just hop over to my editor. I'll delete this. If, for example, here we can see the functions are demonstrated and I have this haystack. A common workaround is to do a test using string position. Now there is, of course, the first word in my haystack, and I test if it's at zero. That's potentially inefficient because if we don't get a match at the start of the string, then PHP has to carry on through the entire string. This string isn't particularly long, but we can easily imagine uh, on a much longer string how inefficient that could be. It's also kind of unreadable. Many of us are used to this, so we can figure out what it means, but it's not as apparent, it's not as readable as this de facto one here. There's other workarounds that are quite common uh, as an alternative to doing string position. Uh, for example, we can effectively do a slice using a substring. We can grab, we can measure the length of the needle and, and use that to extract uh, the first few characters from the haystack and then do a comparison. But again, that's two function calls and a comparison. It's less efficient than using these new built-ins. 
I'll very quickly run this because uh, I think time's time's getting on, so I'm going to have to skip ahead a little bit. Oops. Okay, there we go. So string starts with yes, it starts with there returned true. String ends with errors. It doesn't, of course, because there's a period symbol here. I just wanted to illustrate that. If I correct it and rerun it, I get the expected output. And string contains the word cache, as indeed it does. That is how those work. Uh, there's a good question there from Alex. Performance of those new functions versus reg, uh, regular expressions. Uh, in general principle, for simple bits of work, working with strings, it's generally recommended to use the, the, the built-in string functions uh, as opposed to a regular expression. So that's a great question. I think we need to measure each case on a case-by-case -case basis to really figure that out. And any flag to activate case sensitive on the new string functions? No, not so far as I know. Um, potentially that might come in a, a later version of PHP perhaps PHP 8.1, but so far it's just the three functions that I, that I mentioned. So these last few changes, we'll work through them quite quickly. These are not exactly major language features. They're, they're things that have been introduced for reasons of cleanup and consistency. Starting with the trailing comma, and the key goal here, at least from my perspective, is less code review noise. Um, so we, we illustrated the trailing comma earlier on. At the end of an array, we can have a trailing comma, for example. And as I think of PHP 7.4, we've also been able to have, a, uh, to have a trailing comma at the end of a function call. So the last argument can have a trailing comma after it. What we weren't able to do up until now was have a trailing comma in the param list for the function or in the use list if we're dealing with an anonymous, anonymous function, sorry, or a closure. Uh, but now we can. And hopefully that's clear enough, just because we're, we're getting close to the end and I'll move ahead rather than illustrate that particular one with code. Floats as strings. So up until now, the string representation of a float has varied according to locale settings. Uh, but from PHP 8 onwards, they're going to be consistent and that will reduce the burden on code to account for any differences. So what I mean here is that um, in my locale, for example, if I go back to my editor, I'll just, I might have a value such as 123.456. And if that is stringified somehow, um, the output will be pretty much what you see here. I didn't save my change, let me redo that. Okay, and we see the output has the period or full stop character as the decimal separator, but in some locales uh, we'd actually see a comma. As of PHP 8, it will always use the period symbol, and that just gives us more consistency there. Non-strict comparisons, this is quite an important one, particularly if you're working with a legacy code base. So loose comparison of strings using the double equal sign operator could previously lead to surprising results. And by extension, the introduction of subtle bugs. And that's now been cleaned up. So starting at the top, we can see that if we compare zero, again, this is in cases where we use the, the double equal sign as opposed to the triple uh, equal sign, which also tests for type. Um, if we compare this to a non-empty string, non-empty and non-numeric string, under PHP 7, that's going to return true. Under PHP 8, this will be false. This next example, I'm comparing 1, 2, 3 to another non-empty string. The difference is that this one does start with a few characters that could be treated as a numeric string. Under PHP 7, this would be true. Uh, it essentially discards the rest of this string and does a comparison. Under PHP 8 though, it'll be false. Now those two I think in most cases make a lot of sense. Probably the most surprising one that might uh, catch a few projects out, particularly again if they have legacy code, is this final one where zero is compared non-strict comparison to an empty string. Under PHP 7, that returned true. Under PHP 8 though, 
uh, that's going to return false. I'll just illustrate that here. If I run this code under PHP 7, we get true for all of those. If I run it again this time, let's use PHP 8, they all return false. Stable sorts this is another nice change. So PHP provides a wide range of sorting functions, largely for dealing with arrays. And before PHP 8, these were considered unstable. From PHP 8 onwards, though, they're going to behave in a stable fashion. And that principally means that the original order of the source array will be maintained. So just for clarity uh, about what we mean by stable versus unstable, here's a short list of pizzas. And I want to sort them by size. So I want the smalls first and then the mediums. Now here's an unstable sort. You can see that the first small pizza is a vegetarian. But in the original list, the first small is a pepperoni. And so on. We can see that the first medium is pepperoni. But in the original list, the first medium is a vegetarian. Well, now what we're considering a stable sort for the, this discussion, that wouldn't happen. The original order is preserved uh, as best as can happen. So some code to, to demonstrate that, and I'll also show the source data. Here's a, a big old list um, of books, book titles in the first column, and the length of the book in the second. It's not in any particular order, either by page length or alphabetically by title. It's somewhat random. The only thing that these books have in common is that they all reference uh, the word programming, and, or the book description references the word programming. So I have some, a function here that basically delivers that list uh, as an array of objects. You can see the expected structure here. And I've got a typical custom sort function here. You can see I'm acting on the length property of each. And let's look at the output. And we'll, again, we'll run this under both runtimes. So using PHP 7, first of all. Well, straight away, it appears like it's done its job. We can see the left-hand column of, of the page length is ordered correctly. I'm going to zoom up to books with a length of 120, because I identified this as an interesting case. And we can see that the first book with a length of 120 is Hello World. But let's look back at the source data. I'm going to search for 120. The first result is actually Notebook not hello world. So unstable sort. Let's rerun this. I'll do it with PHP 8. And we're expecting notebook to be the first example. For books with a length of 120, let's scroll up. And it is. And if I went through this, we'd see that things follow the correct order. Um, Hello World Next, followed by My Love as a Programmer, followed by World's Best Programmer at the end. There we go. So that's stable sorts. And in so again, in some cases, that will remove surprises. So wrapping up, uh, there's a lot more than we've covered here today. Uh, there's so much that's shipping, we just couldn't cover it all. JIT or just-in-time compilation is coming to PHP uh, as an optional thing. There's going to be the ability to have more detailed error traces if we want. Non-capturing catchy, so dealing with try-catch structures. Um, we're going to be able to avoid placing the exception into a variable if we want. A number of errors have been reclassified, so in a sense they've been upgraded from notice to warning level and so on. There are some security fixes and changes to how we tokenize code, particularly relating to namespaces. I think that will affect very few projects. And last but not least, uh, weak maps have been introduced. Um, again, we don't have time to cover that today. Um, if you're familiar with JavaScript ES6, you, you may well know of uh, weak maps from there. So I'm going to, oh, and I should also cover really fast, support in the ecosystem. Uh, lots of editors and IDs are already actively working in PHP 8 support, but it's not quite there yet. You can see I've added a note that the new union type syntax is supported by PHP Storm, for example. 
um, but a lot of other things aren't supported. And that just to say, if you are an early adopter, you'll probably find that you'll have to put up with some amount of noise from your usual dev tools until they catch up and have uh, more complete support for PHP 8. Skip the slide there. So we've got some useful links. We'll email these out um, shortly. The official timeline and the list of proposals that constitute PHP 8 can be found in the PHP wiki. And we've also put together a short repo with code samples um, that uh, you can download and play with if you're so inclined. Uh, and of course, feel free if you think you can improve an example or add a new example, definitely feel free to submit a pull request. That'd be great. So we're pretty much up against the clock here. We probably don't have time for a whole lot of other questions. I'll take a quick look in the chat. Uh, I absolutely wanted to thank you all for attending. I, I hope this has been informative and at least given you a taste of what's coming in PHP 8. So thanks so much for attending. Uh, last but not least, we do have this feedback survey. Uh, you can see a QR code if you want to snap it uh, and a, a link there. And I think Laura is going to post it in chat as well. Uh, we love to hear feedback. If this worked for you, if it didn't work for you, please let us know. If there's other topics that you're interested in or you'd want to hear more about a specific topic, again, we'd love to know. Uh, so definitely please reach out and drop us a message. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, Nestor, if, if you're still there, I see your question zero. Uh, equals equals, I think the string zero. Um, I think we covered that. Possibly it wasn't visible on the screen initially, um, but in that case, PHP 7 would return true. Uh, PHP 8 would return false. Actually, I beg your pardon, I misread your question. Um, that's a great one. If you want to hang on, I will literally test it right now. So under PHP 8, that returns true. And under PHP 7, also true. So in that case, no change. Hope that answers your question. Hopefully I picked that up correctly. Okay, thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight. Thank you, everyone. Please don't forget to answer the feedback form and keep, a, keep an eye on the PHP Jalisco Twitter and Facebook feeds for more talks we're going to have in the future alongside uh, Wiseline Academy. Thank you for joining. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.